church for certain um and um, just been getting to know them a little bit um and uh, they invite me to come and speak uh, so i'm married to lou um we've been married 10 years this summer i know we don't look like we're old enough to have been married 10 years um i don't feel old enough to have married 10 years either um uh, we have two children so we have um isaac who is six years old and we have daisy who is uh coming up to 18 months. Isaac is our birth child and um, Daisy we adopted at the start of this year. She was placed with us in January. And um, as Alex was talking about, it's adoption that I wanted, I wanted to just help us think through a little bit today. And so I'm going to spend the next 40 minutes or so just unpacking this theme of adoption. And, and it's going to be part personal testimony. It's going to be part kind of a biblical theology, some application and and part gentle kick up the missional backside, I hope. Um, <clears throat> and then a chance for you guys to ask any questions. Um, and that could be questions personally about our experience or um, picking up on anything that I've said in terms of the theology or, or God's part for adoption and that kind of stuff. Um, so maybe as I'm going, it might be helpful just to jot some questions down as they come up, because um, we are going to cover a fair bit of ground over the next 40 minutes. And um, yeah, we're going we're gonna to dot around the Bible a bit as well. I think adoption is a theme that comes up throughout the scriptures. And so if you've got a Bible, it might be helpful just to um, have that to hand as well. But let me, let me start with my story. Uh, I was 15 when I decided that I was going to adopt. Um, so I was in a youth group. Um, I was 15. And the youth leader um, was giving a talk about something completely irrelevant, uh, irrelevant to the theme of adoption, not irrelevant to us, because it was a talk on the Bible. Um, and um, he made a throwaway comment about how we've been adopted into God's family. And as a result, um, Christians should be pro-adoption. And it was a throwaway comment that had no real flow with the rest of the talk. And it just it stuck with me. And, um, and it was like a seed that just got planted there at 15. And I knew at that point I wanted to adopt. Um, and, and just encouragement for those of you who speak to people, we, I mean, we all speak to people, but those who communicate from the front or uh, disciple folk, sometimes the Holy Spirit uses a throwaway comment to plant a seed in someone's life that you can never imagine it would. Um, so in, encourage you guys um, in that. And, but that seed kind of lay dormant there. I met Lou when I was 18 and she was 16. And our, as our relationship grew, we did the thing you do. We talked about future. We talked about kids. And I shared that we wanted to adopt. And Lou certainly didn't seem against it. And so um, we just kind of got on with it, popped it to the back of our minds. We got married. And basically every few months, I don't know if you've ever had this experience with something. Um, someone would say something in a sermon or we'd watch a video or we'd go to a conference and the Holy Spirit would just remind us of this adoption thing. You ever had that with anything? When there's something the Holy Spirit speaks to you about and he just reminds, he's not saying now, he's just saying, don't forget, don't forget. And we had that every few months. Uh, and then Lou got pregnant with Isaac. And, um, and right as Lou got pregnant, uh, we had this really big prompt from the Holy Spirit. And that's so inconvenient, isn't it? Because we are literally just about to have a birth child. Why are you talking to us about this now? But we made inquiries and uh, we found out you, you can have a birth child and then adopt. And um, so we just kind of got our head down and got on with having a baby, um, which sounds really easy. But um, I think it was easier for me than Lou, perhaps. Um, and uh, but if I'm being honest, we found actually having a, a young baby really hard. And I think it's important to say that because we often get this picture that it's super easy. Um, and, and when we see people having children, they go to their coffee shops, there's this newborn baby lying beautifully asleep while they drink their uh, cup of cappuccinos and lattes. And it's all so perfect. That was not our experience at all. We really, really struggled. And so when Isaac was about six months old, we swore we were done with kids. Like that was it. <laughs> we were done, we weren't gonna go through that nonsense again. Um, and then when Isaac was two, the Holy Spirit, just prompt for this again and it was that we just we just couldn't ignore it um you know when you get that conviction that you just know to ignore it would be wrong and so we pushed the door we went to an information in evening we had an initial interview and we kind of starting down that track and then Isaac gets sick um he was diagnosed with a chronic kidney condition which um he still has um and he had some ongoing treatment with some just horrific side effects 
and um and that year when between Isaac was two and a half to three and a half was just it was really hard we were we got we were on our knees at that point and so adoption gets put on the back burner of course and then at that point my family fell apart spectacularly like tv show spectacularly it it, it was it was insane um kind of the stuff that was going on and, and that's the point we started hope church so that's when we met paul and janie and um i i don't know if we talked about this too widely but we came to the point at hope church two years ago where we were just broken we were completely broken we felt like we had nothing to offer and um we'd had a horrible year with isaac and his health that my family had kind of collapsed and it was just it, it broke us Lou, Lou's had some counseling recently for that I, I'm hoping to get some soon because the ongoing effects of kind of that year um, and then within a few months of starting at Hope the father just does his thing and he comes knocking again and goes now's the time and so we're in this place of real emptiness and brokenness um, but also a place of real closeness with the father and he goes now's the time and so we reached out to the council. They tell us to wait for six months because of everything that's happened just in our lives. And it's like God again is saying, how much do you want this? How much are you going to wait? And then six months later, we come back, we book onto stage one training. And stage one training is where they do absolutely everything in their power to make you not want to adopt. That's, that's the point of stage one training. And so we went through that and we got approved. And then we booked to stage two training. Um, and that's where you have eight three hour interviews with a social worker and they dig into every area of your life. They dig into your finances, your work, your motivation for adoption, your family history. That was quite awkward at the time. They dig into your personal life, your marriage, all intimate parts of your marriage, everything. They dig into it. Um, and then we got approved for that. We went to panel. We got approved to adopt. And then a few weeks later, our social worker says, we found this little girl and we think she's right for you. So here's some information. Let us know what you think. And we read this few pages of A4 um, and straight away, we just know this is her. This is the one. And so we make contact with the foster carers. We get her photos. We get her story, her birth mum's story, the whole family history. And then we meet this little girl, this one-year-old in a park. Um, and we know that she's likely to become our daughter, but to, to us, to her, we're just these random strangers. And it's so weird and yet incredibly precious. We go back to panel and they approve the match. And I, I cannot describe to you how we felt when they, they, we finished panel and they go around and they, they say what, e what each of the panel members think about whether you should adopt this child. And they say, we unanimously recommend you to adopt Daisy. And just a wave of emotion at that point. Um, and then we have a week of introductions where we go to the foster carer's house and we get to learn her, we get to introduce ourselves to her and learn her routines. And it went so well, the week only lasted three days. And then Daisy is officially placed with us and we become a family of four. And that's our story. And all that really is to say that for us, a theology of adoption is not just a hypothetical thing. It is fundamental to our story and also fundamental to how we see God. And so what I want to do is I want to give four reasons why I think adoption is amazing. And then a few ways, four ways that you and I can be pro-adoption. OK, so four reasons why I think adoption is amazing, and then four ways that we can be pro-adoption. Okay, so the first way is this. Adoption is at the heart of how God relates to us. Adoption is at the heart of how God relates to us. So who is God? Like if you were to describe God, how would you describe him? There's so many words you could use, loads of different adjectives. He is kind, he's powerful, he's holy, he's generous, he's faithful, he's righteous, he's compassionate. But I think there is one word that describes who God, the God of the Bible is. So 1 John chapter four is where we're gonna just start off. And we're gonna flick around all over the place. I'm gonna read first from 1 John chapter four. And you'll know these verses well. 1 John four and verse eight. 
Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. God is love. He is not just a loving God, though he is. It's who he is. It's at the heart of his being, at the heart of his existence. If, if you could, if I could put it like this, if you could cut God in two, he would bleed love, if that makes sense. But only the God of our scriptures can say that. You cannot say that Allah is love because there was a time in history where Allah was alone in the cosmos. How can Allah be love when there is no one for him to love, when there is no object of his love? At most, you could say that Allah is loving now. And he started loving when he started creating. But the God of the Bible is eternally father, son and spirit, a divine community, a divine community of love. The father loving the son in the joy of the spirit for all eternity. And so God never learned how to love because he is love. And so when God creates, when the father creates, he, he, he does it not out of a desire to have people serve him. He creates, it's an overflow of the love of the Trinity. God is love. And so he wants to catch us up in that love. That's why he creates humanity. And that's why couples have kids, right? We don't, I didn't have Isaac because we wanted someone to help us do the dishes or load the dishwasher or help us with the washing, although it's helpful um, when he only does that. But that's not why we had him. We had him because of the overflow of our love as a couple. So God creates humanity out of love, Adam and Eve. And then, of course, it goes downhill, doesn't it? We all know that. So what does God do? What is God's redemption plan in history? It's adoption. And it's in the whole Bible. Genesis 12. So Abraham, we'll start with Abraham, the father of, of, of our faith, the father of the, the Jewish faith, father Abraham, many, many sons. Um, so God takes this man who is completely of a different family. Like he's a pagan, probably worshiping the moon, like not in the family of God. And yet Genesis 12 happens. He says, you're mine. I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. What's he saying? He's saying, you're mine. You're mine now. And what am I going to do? I'm going to bless you. I'm going to protect you. I'm going to provide for you. And what am I expecting from you in return? Just trust me. This is the language of adoption. This is what an adoptive parent says to the child. Come into my house. Come into my family. I'm going to provide for you. I'm going to look after you. I'm going to build a future for you and with you. I am for you and you are mine. And then we can fast forward. We can go to David. So Turn with me to Psalm chapter two. I mean, you could go anywhere with this, but I love just this. We're just going to look at a verse in Psalm two. Psalm two and verse seven. He, God, said to me, you are my son. Today, I have become your father. This is adoption. God, the king, invites David into his royal family and has him as king under him. And implicitly, he adopts the whole nation of Israel, right? The whole nation of Israel adopted because the king is adopted. And, and even when the people of Israel rebel in the Old Testament, he still longs to be a father to these adopted kids. So Jeremiah is where we're going to go next. Jeremiah 3. And verse 19. Hear this father heart of God. I myself said, how gladly would I treat you like my children and give you a pleasant land, the most beautiful inheritance of, every, of any nation. I thought you would call me father and not turn away from following me. Do you hear the longing of a father whose adopted children have forsaken him? He longs for them to come back to the family home. And there is a side point here. When you adopt, that's not a temporary thing. That's a forever thing. We talk about kids coming into their forever home. 
God has adopted the people of Israel. They're his, right? I don't think he's done with them yet. I think he's got plans for them yet. I'd hope I'd be getting an amen to that <laughs> if you weren't all muted. But I think that's really important to remember. And, and we could go on and on. And, you know, we could go all the way through um, the, the Bible with this. Um, but um, uh, the clearest picture of adoption, I mean, we talked about Romans 8, but the clearest picture of adoption is Jesus. And Jesus himself is adopted. Let's not forget that. Like Joseph's not his biological dad. Joseph adopts him. I love that. And we go to any number of verses. We could go to Romans 8, but I want to go to Galatians 4. So Galatians 4 is where we're going to settle um, now. Galatians 4, 4 to 7. But when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law so that we might receive adoption to sonship. Because you are his sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out Abba, Father. You are no longer a slave, you are God's child. And since you're his child, God has also made you an heir. One of the most moving moments the last few months, Daisy's learning to speak and she, she now looks at me and says, Dada. And if that melts my heart, imagine what it does to our Heavenly Father when we come to him and say, Dada. And he knows the cost of adoption. And we enjoy that. Through Christ, we are adopted sons and daughters. We have a new name. We have a new legal status. We have a new inheritance. We have a new family. This is how God relates to us. In the saving work of Jesus. So firstly, adoption is the heart of how God relates. And it's not a new thing. It's not a New Testament thing. It's, it's how he's always done it. Secondly, God, adoption demonstrates God's heart for the vulnerable. Adoption demonstrates God's heart for the vulnerable. So I want to throw some statistics at you. In the UK, um, 40,000 children enter the care system every year. That's about 109 children a day. Um, there are 100,000 children in the UK currently classified as looked after, um, but we're 10,000 foster families short in order to meet that need. There are 3,000 children right now waiting for adoption in the UK. So right now, 3,000 children waiting for adoption. Half of those children have been waiting longer than 18 months. Of those who leave the care system, that means they reach the age of 18 and they kind of graduate from the care system without having been adopted. So children who are in the care system have never been adopted. They make up a quarter of our homeless population. So a quarter of people on the streets have gone through the care system. A third of our care leavers become homeless within the first two years of leaving care. Half of men under 21 in the justice system are care leavers. And if you leave the care system at 18 without having been adopted, you are three times more likely to not be in education, not be in employment or in training. So that's like 40% of care leavers are not in education or employed or in training. In other words, if you are in the care system all the way to 18, and you don't get adopted, you are statistically very, very likely to either be homeless, an addict, unemployed, or in prison. And if you're in the care system and you're over four years old, your chances of being adopted are only 20%. And that's if you're white and you're a girl with no additional needs. If you're non-white and a boy with additional needs, your chances of being adopted are basically zero, statistically. And the thing is, we know from the statistics I said just a minute ago, if you're not adopted, where you're heading at, where you're heading most likely. Because the fact is these children don't choose this path. Like almost all children are put into care because they're 
because of abuse or neglect or unsuitable family situations or other horrific situations where it's considered, imagine it's less harmful to take people away from their family than it is to keep them there. This means that almost every child in the care system has either witnessed abuse or been subject to abuse or trauma that most of us will never come close to witnessing. And then we come to God's word, which says that God desires us to act justly and love mercy and walk humbly, which says that pure religion is to love the widows and the orphans, that true fasting is to loose the chains of injustice and set the oppressed free. But we read that the Messiah came to proclaim good news to who? To the poor, to bind up the broken hearted, to proclaim freedom to those in captivity. This has been kind of our journey over the last few years. I think our journey as a church actually is that God is opening our eyes to his unceasing heart for the poor, for the vulnerable, for the hurting and for the broken hearted. And what can express God's heart? For these people more than saying, you are mine and I love you and I'm never going to leave you. And the ending of your story is going to be rewritten and the cycle that you've been born into is going to be broken. Because I think of Daisy's family history. I think of a family background going back generations. And now I see she has a chance for that cycle to be broken, that cycle of abuse and addiction and prison. Now is a chance to be broken. And that leads me to my third point. And forgive me for being pragmatic, but adoption is a great mission or strategy. <laughs> because now not only does Daisy have a chance to break that cycle of addiction, abuse, neglect and prison, she also has a chance to know Jesus. The chance of her coming into contact with a Christian while in her birth family, almost zero, because middle class, lovely evangelical Christians like many of us, don't go to these places but now she has a chance to get to know Jesus for herself and and I'm sure that all of our churches have a heart for the, the vulnerable and I'm sure all of us want to support work with homeless and the poor and addicts and sex workers and those in prison I'm sure all of our churches want to support ministries like this but the stats show us that a massive portion of all these groups of people those in sex work and addiction and those who are the, the materially poor or homeless those who are in prison a massive chunk of those people have gone through the care system which means if we adopt children in the care system we get to reach the homeless and the poor and the addicts and sex workers and inmates before they ever get there Archbishop Desmond Tutu put it like this. There comes a point where we need to stop just pulling people out the river. We need to go upstream and find out why they're falling in. When a child's adopted or fostered, they're not just pulled out the river, they're stopped from ever having to jump in the river in the first place. And when a child is adopted by Christians, they get the privilege of being introduced to Christ at the same time. And this is not to say that everything is hunky-dory once you get adopted. It's just, it's just not true. Family life is hard. And Christian parents are not perfect parents. But we get a chance. I love adoption because it's at the heart of how God relates to us. It demonstrates God's heart for the vulnerable. It's a great missional strategy. And it gives us a picture of our walk with the Father. And I could speak on this point alone for hours. If I ever write a book, <laughs> it will be on this point. Um, I just want to look at it from one angle. When Daisy joined us, she was not happy about it. <laughs> She'd been with her foster carers for a year. For all intents and purposes, they were her parents. And then suddenly her world is turned upside down. And so it took her two weeks before we saw her smile. It took her three weeks before she'd let me come near her. If Lou was in the room as well, she just attached to Lou. That was her like coping strategy. She, she wouldn't go near me at all, always to Lou. It was over a month before she would choose to make any eye contact whatsoever. And even now, if, if, you, if, if you met her, she doesn't know you, she's much more likely to avert her eyes than actually make any kind of eye contact. She won't smile at you, no chance. It took her two months with us before she properly laughed. If the, in the first month, if anyone came to the front door, she would freak out because she associated people coming to the front door with being taken away. She's, she's like a year at this point. 
Imagine the trauma if you're in the care system for four years. Now she's ours and we have loved her more than anything from day one. But the last few months for Daisy have been a journey of her learning to be loved by us. Of learning that we're going to provide for her. Of having to learn to let us love her and learn how to be secure in our love for her. And I just think that's an amazing picture. Isn't the Christian life a journey of allowing ourselves to be loved by God? Learning that he's not angry with us all the time. That he loves us. Learning that we don't need to hide from him when we mess up. Learning that he wants to look us full in the face and smile on us. That's what we pray in number six. In the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord turn his face, uh, make, make his face towards and the one about him shining, his face shining on us and giving us peace, yeah? You get the point. I should have actually looked that one up. I made a mess of that one. We've been singing it for the last 12 months nonstop. I'm not sure how I made a mess of that. But you get the point. He wants to shine his face on us. Learning we don't need to earn his love. We don't need to earn his approval because we have it in Christ. Learning his love is all we need. We don't need to go to other things, to other idols for approval and security. Learning to rest and enjoy our new name, our new family, our new inheritance. When I see Daisy, I see me and my heavenly father. As I see her resisting our love, I see how so often I resist the love of the father. And as I see these natural stirrings in me to pursue her, whether or not I get affirmation and love and affection in return, I see how much greater is my father's desire to pursue those who don't want to return his love. And if I long for Daisy to be more secure in my love for her as my daughter, how much more is my heavenly father longing for me to be secure in his love for me? And how much does he long for you to be secure in his love for you. I love adoption. It's at the heart of how God relates to us. It's a, it shows God's heart for the vulnerable. It's a great missional strategy and it gives the picture of our world with the Father. But what do we do with this? Like, I'm going to start to kind of wrap up now. What, what does it look like? I hope we're all theologically convinced that adoption is great. <laughs> but what does it look like to be pro-adoption? Well, the first thing it looks like is adopting uh, or fostering. And you can't really start anywhere else, can it? And um, I don't know. I don't know your situation. I know we all have an idea of what an adopter and a fosterer looks like and what they don't look like. But my, my experience tells me that God just stirs whoever's heart he wants to stir. And we can also spiritually adopt. When Lou and I were first married, we were adopted by a couple at our church then. And um, they just gave us free reign to their home. They, um, they let us stay there. They let us go around anytime we wanted to. When Isaac was born, we didn't have family up here at that point, And they just kind of became second parents to us. And we just saw what family looked like. We saw what hospitality looked like and Christian generosity looked like. And we kind of shaped and molded our marriage almost on them because they, they kind of spiritually adopted us when we came. And um, I think that's what we're called to do as church family, to spiritually adopt. So many of you guys here will have been Christians for decades and you have so much to give. And there's going to be young folk in your church or folk younger than you who you can bless by giving them time and, and giving them the wealth of your experience. And who else is going to carry the fire for mission to the Jewish people unless those who have the fire now are going to invest in the next generation? So it's, it looks like adopting. Secondly, it looks like those who are uh, supporting those who are fostering and adopting. Raising an adoptive child is a completely different ball game to raising a birth child. Um, a birth child is basically a blank sheet of paper. Obviously, there's the genetic aspect and all of that kind of stuff. But an, an adopted child, from even if they're adopted on day one, which basically never happens, um, they've undergone trauma. And that might have been trauma in utero, but actually the impact of that can still be massive of drug and alcohol misuse or all that kind of stuff. But more, more often, any adopted child has witnessed or experienced trauma themselves, which massively affects a child's development emotionally, socially, spiritually, in every kind of way, which means adopters need people around them 
who will pray for them and will pray with them and will listen to them and won't judge them when their kids are running amok in Sunday school because they don't know how to deal with the pressure of, of groups of people. Our church family has been amazing. When Daisy came, we didn't have to cook a meal for weeks, literally weeks. We just kept on being given free meals. It was amazing. And they respected the fact that we needed a hideaway to allow Daisy to attach to us because you've got to learn that we're her parents. So there was no handling the baby at church where, you know, that thing where the newborn baby comes and everyone wants to hold the newborn. That doesn't happen with an adopted child. It can't happen. It doesn't work like that. Like even now I can count on one hand the number of people who've held her. Um, she's got to learn who mum and dad are. And actually, one of the ways you can support fostering and adoption is by supporting those who are doing it in our church families and our lives. They need people like you around them who are going to understand. Thirdly, encouraging others to adopt. Um, one of the most common things we hear when um, we've told people that we're adopting is people saying, oh, we thought about doing that at one point. We hear it literally all the time. Um, and absolutely no judgment at all. I can't judge. But I think what happens is people have a kind of thought about adoption and they have their own kids and it's just not an option anymore. Um, and my, I would love to see the next generation be a generation that, that takes adoption really, really seriously. But it only happens if they seriously consider it before starting to have their own kids and probably even seriously consider it before they get married. So what if when people are preparing for marriage, instead of it being assumed that in a few years they're going to have kids of their own, what if every couple that's preparing for marriage, someone gets alongside them and says, hey, I know you're just getting married, but at some point you're going to think about kids. Why do you ask the Lord if he wants you to adopt? What if every couple getting ready for marriage was asked that question and they can prayerfully consider it? What if in our youth work we talked more about God's heart for the vulnerable and the need for adoption? What if it was just on the table from day one? What if the church got known as a place where kids were adopted? Being pro-adoption, it looks like adopting, supporting those who adopt, encouraging people to adopt. And then fourthly, and finally, it looks like engaging with Home for Good. Home for Good is a Christian charity that its mission is to encourage adoption and fostering in the local church. They believe that the church is a natural place for adoption to happen because you've got people who have a theological conviction that adoption is right, and you also have a ready-made support network. Our social worker was gobsmacked when we talked about our support network. When we said, you know, when she asked, you know, if, if a, a disaster happened, Daisy needs to go to hospital at A&E, and you couldn't take Isaac with you, who would you ring to look after Isaac overnight? And we, 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 we named 20 to 25 people straight off the bat who, who are DBS checked and who Isaac knows and trusts and who we know and trust. And she couldn't believe, I think she thought that we were like super not discerning about who we spend time with, but that's just church. The church is a ready-made place to support people who are adopting and fostering. If you or your churches can link up for Home for Good, I honestly believe it could change the culture of your church. I believe that together it could change the culture of, of your city. Like we said earlier that there are 3,000 children waiting to be adopted in the UK. Do you know how many churches there are in the Evangelical Alliance right now? There's 3,300. That's one adopted child in every church. And there's no more children waiting for adoption right now. What if the church rose up and just became the place where adopted children go? What if the church became the place that our social services and our city councils and our county councils looked to when they had children that needed placing, children from difficult backgrounds, children who are going to have needs because they know the church is going to step up. I think it could change the face of a care system in our nation. So let me pray. Father, I thank you that you before we ever even thought of loving you, you loved us. Before we ever met you, you knew us. I thank you that you have adopted your people and you give us the rights of the son.
and Lord, our hearts break over the thousands and thousands of children whose lives are headed down a certain track through no fault of their own. And we ask that you break our hearts for what breaks yours. We ask Heavenly Father, would you cause the church in the UK to rise up and demonstrate your heart of compassion? Lord, we talked so much about how this nation is changing and moving away from biblical values. I want to pray that as the church rises up, the world would not be able to ignore the supernatural, glorious goodness and power of you at work through your people as your people are moved to compassion. Lord, I know that this is going to be a sensitive topic for people. I don't know the backgrounds here of everyone, but you do. And so I ask Heavenly Father, where this has stirred stuff up, that you would be that healing balm. You'd send your spirit of peace and the knowledge of your adoption of us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So I know you um, often open up for questions. I'm not sure how you want to do this, Alex. You got any ideas? Thanks, thanks Matt. That, that was really, really wonderful. I mean, kind of, um, yeah, such a challenge to us. And thank you for sharing something, not just from the scriptures, but also something so, so, so personal. I think, that, I think we all feel very blessed to have had your input uh, this afternoon with us. So, so thank you so much for doing that. But I'm sure there may be a few questions or comments so um, I think the best way, if you could put your question, if you've got a question, you can put it on the chat um, and then I will, um, I've got the chat up on my screen. So I'm going to ask you, Matt, Matt questions from the chat and then, um, uh, so the questions are, I'm, I'm not going to say who's asking the questions just to protect if, it, if it's something sort of a personal issue. But um, so the first question is, um, has there been any kind of pushback, any kickback from the care system against, you know, this idea of, you know, obviously you're talking as a Christian, you can mm. see certain privileges in, and opportunities uh, as a Christian in adopting. And I guess you've been open about that um, in terms of, you know, you, I think you use the word mission strategy or whatever. But is, is this sort of, you know, we live in a very secular world where, yeah. you know, what, what's been the kind of ripples around that? Thank you. And I didn't use the word missional strategy to our social worker. <laughs> I'm sure we can appreciate. Um, so we are very blessed in Leicester that the adoption team used to be headed up by a, an evangelical Christian. And so he, he trained the team to um, understand how faith is a good thing in terms of adoption. And there's a lot of work going into that at the moment. I hope for good at doing a lot of work, but actually increasingly council recognizing that faith community is a great place to, to have for a children to be raised. Um, now, we didn't come up with many problems. Obviously the, the question they're always really keen to ask is what happens if your child um, comes out as gay or transgender? They're always gonna ask that. And so we were prepared for that. And I think the problem that Christians may often fall into is they give a nice long theological answer. Um, when actually what social workers wanna know is you're gonna love the child. They wanna know that whatever happens, you're gonna love them. And you know, we talked about you know, our views, but ultimately when it got down to it, if, if Daisy, if that's the path that Daisy ends up going down and, you know, we, we, we pray against that and all that stuff. But if that's where Daisy goes, we are going to love her and we're not going to kick her out of the family. We're not going to cut her out of the inheritance. She's our daughter. And so that, that's the line we went down. And it's certainly not that we avoided talking about our faith. In fact, we talked about it a lot. Um, but the, the underlying thing is we want a child and that we are just going to commit to whatever comes. Um, so that's kind of the line we took. And I think because our, our council have been trained really, really well, they saw that as a, as a good thing. 
Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Um, I suppose what kind of strikes me, and I wanted to have people have said something similar, um, is that what you say obviously is so, I mean, it makes, it makes wonderful sense. Um, you know, um, so what, why is it, do you think that so many of us as Christians who are committed to families and committed to, um, to sort of community life, haven't really engaged with this issue very much before really? I mean, it, I, I, I can't, I mean, you know, I know the scriptures and, and I understand that, what, what you've said here about that, but you know, I don't think I've ever heard a church leader give uh, a good advocacy for the importance of adoption. I've never heard that in 40 years of a day ministry. So, what, you know, I mean, hope I haven't not just been paying attention, but I just, I just wonder why you think that is, you know? Yeah. And, um, so there, I think there are lots of reasons. Um, I think for a long time, and I, I want to tread really, really carefully here, um, it's been seen that adoption is a last option for people who can't have children. Um, and that's kind of been how adoption has been viewed or can't have biological children for whatever reason. Um, and so to talk about it, you're, you're opening up a whole can of worms, aren't you? If you're preaching it, because you're going to bring up a whole load of stuff that um yeah and it, it was often done in secret you know um i was speaking to some mission partners at an old church and they're in their 70s now and they were talking about their uh, inability to have birth children they pursued adoption at one point it didn't work out um, but they said it was all done in secret and um i think it's got to the point where there's such a need that um that it, the time has come for, for for people to speak out and increasingly it feels like the father is stirring up people to consider adoption before having birth children <clears throat> and i don't know quite why that is but it feels like the father is stirring something up um, to do that but as i said i think a lot of people consider it at some point and i think the more we can talk about it the more that that fleeting thought that goes maybe one day i'll adopt actually becomes a no this is actually just what this is something that Christians consider. Um, we're, it's amazing what God's doing in our church. It's remarkable. that, it, And this is nothing to do with us. It feels like almost, almost every month we've got someone new coming to our church saying we're about to start the process for adoption or fostering or we're really considering um, whether this might be for us. And that's not because of us. The Father's just stirring that up. And I think that might similar thing might be happening nationwide. Um, so it, it, the short answer is I don't know. Um, but I think there was a lot of stigma about adoption and I think there is still a lot of stigma about infertility and I think the two are see have always been seen as coexisting of going together um, and now I think people are starting to see that that they're not necessarily mutually exclusive. Thank you. We've also got another question here which I think is a lovely question about how best can we uh, support and be involved with Homes for Good. I, I assume that's the adoption charity. Yes, um, and they train um, local councils and, and um, adoption agencies and all that kind of stuff. Um, so there's, there's a number of ways. The best way is firstly to go on their website. I think they've got a lot of good resources there. Um, one of the ways that we very subtly do things is we, every Mother's Day, we advertise Home for Good because they're so good in terms of things like Mother's and Father's Day. And we often go, yay, Mother's Day, let's give stuff to all the mums. And actually, Mother's Day is a really hard time for both um, mums and fathers and children um, who've grown up in the care system or, or, or whose relationships with mum is, is difficult. And so they, they have wonderful video resources we play every year and we talk a bit about it then. Um, so go on their website. There may well be a local branch of Home for Good where you are. And you can find that out and you can link up with a Home for Good leader. Our, our Home for Good lead for Leicester is in our church. Um, and so you can get someone to come and speak at your church. Um, Krish Kandaya, I don't know if you know Krish Kandaya. He used to be head of the EA. He then left that to set up Home for Good. Um, and so he has a wonderful book, which I think is called Home for Good, um, which is just 
is stunning. And if you want your heart stirred for adoption and fostering, that's that's the book that's going to do it. Um, yeah. So Krish Kandaya is kind of the man to check out, I think, on this. OK, just got a couple of final points. Um, I mean, this is you know, perhaps a little bit more emotionally sensitive, but I mean, obviously, many people who are perhaps pro-abortion would be pro-abortion because of so many unwanted children. So in a sense, is this also a way of strengthening the ministry of pro-lifers? Or, mm. or, I mean, do you make that connection at all in your mind, Matt, or in I, your prayers? I really do. And I, I actually make the connection in a slightly unorthodox way in that I make the connection in a way that is actually quite critical of the pro-life movement, because I think so often we are pro-life in terms of abortion, and we should be. But there's a whole a load of other ways that we're, we need to be pro-life as well. And um, this is obviously massive in the States with gun laws and all that kind of stuff. But are we pro-life when it comes to um, stopping the causes that would lead pe many people to consider abortion in the first place? And if adoption, and by adoption, I don't just mean adoption of children but I mean adoption of um, mums who would struggle by themselves to raise a child if the church were to wrap around vulnerable families maybe we'd start to see the abortion level decline now of course there is a whole load of idolatry in that as well in, in, in the kind of the the ideological abortion movement I guess um, where, where children are seen as an inconvenience and of course there's grace for you know folk here I don't know your stories but there's always grace for that but um, I, we're involved with a charity called Safe Families. My wife works with Safe Families and their, their job is to link church members up with vulnerable families in the community. And I think the more that that can happen, the more that we can be pro-life in terms of people who are struggling and who are more likely to have an abortion, the more um, actually we can start to get to the root of some of these things that drive the, the, the abortion epidemic, I think. I'm going to hand back to John in a moment. John, John, if you could perhaps pray for Matt and uh, also just to uh, sum up anything else you want to say in terms of future meetings. Well, the last question here is, how is Isaac related to having a new, a new uh, sibling? Thank you. That's a great question. We were nervous because we, from like from him being two, we've talked about, you know, some babies join families from mummy's tummy and some babies join families through adoption, fostering. And we, we've sown that seed and he's well up for adoption. He was so excited to be part of the process. Um, but we were nervous, like when the rubber hits the road, <laughs> how is he going to respond to this screaming one-year-old who doesn't come in as a baby, who doesn't do anything, but comes in as a one-year-old who wants to punch him in the face and steal his toys straight away. Um, but he's been amazing. He's been so good. And I, we have seen a side to Isaac that we would never have known existed unless we'd done this. Um, a really compassionate, caring, gentle, patient. He's six and he's patient with her. I, I, it's ridiculous, but we're so, so thankful. And he is the biggest advocate for adoption. Every time the teacher talks about whether mommy and daddy are going to have another baby, okay, they could also adopt. <laughs> it's so good. Um, yeah, so he's loved it and he's, he dotes on her and she, she really has warmed. She warmed to him much more, much quicker than me, which was lovely to see actually in some ways because I prepared for her to not really um, warm to me as, as much as Lou. But um, yeah, it was so good. Thank you, Matt. I mean, the other thing which has always struck me in terms of the adoption in the, in the New Testament period, that I, I think I'm writing saying that in the Roman Empire, adoption was very common, much more so than in most Western societies today. I mean, for example, I mean, Nero became emperor because he was adopted by Claudius. I mean, he wouldn't be an emperor without that adoption. But also in, in Roman law, you could disinherit your natural children, but you weren't allowed to disinherit your adopted children. <laughs> So in that, that sense, adoption, if you maybe this says something about God's heart. There's, there's, there's something about adoption actually has a higher status in, 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 in Roman law than it did having natural children, which is interesting. I I'm kind of feel that may be a, an yeah, interesting maybe. area of reflection. One of the things that um, we've had to be really careful of is making sure that 
um, we still show attention and love and care for Isaac as well. Sure. Because sure. you can be so concerned with making sure Daisy is looked after and supported that actually Isaac can feel neglected. So we had to work really, really hard for that. But 